Dr. John Steinbrecher. I'd ask that you please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to MAC Commissioner Dr. John Steinbrecher. Good morning. Um, I believe the last time I had the privilege to stand in front of the media in person was on March 12th, 2020, and that was the day we shut down our basketball tournament due to COVID-19. You know, what a journey it has been since that point. Uh, let me welcome you to the kickoff of the 2021 Mid-American Conference football season. To our guests with us today, our bowl partners, our corporate partners, and the many fans who are joining us, it's good to be with you. Um, you'll probably hear this a lot from a lot of people, but I can't, I'm sure all of us can't wait until that first kickoff, which is really just over five weeks from now. Welcome to our two new head coaches, Maurice Lindquist at Buffalo and Tim Alban at Ohio. Also. We have two new directors of athletics, Akron's Charles Guthrie and Kent State's Rendell Richmond. Welcome to Maction. And before I get too much further, I would be remiss if I'd, I did not recognize and acknowledge the remarkable career of recently retired Ohio head football coach Frank Solich. He transformed the Bobcat football program. And I believe most of our programs would point to him as a model for how to build and sustain a program. The winningest coach in Mid-American Conference history, quite an achievement, and most certainly a future college football Hall of Famer. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epic of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. And it was the winter of despair. It comes from a tale of two cities by Charles Dickens. And it was during my senior year in high school when I was taking an independent study in English literature that I first read and studied Dickens' masterpiece, A Tale of Two Cities. The paragraph I just quoted is perhaps the most famous opening passage in English literature. I'm not sure that as a 17-year-old, I had the capacity or life history to understand how it, is a how it is possible to experience a series of opposites at the same time, or the emotional peaks and valleys conveyed by Dickens. Today, I cannot think of, better, of a better description of the past 17 months. The contrast lived as we witnessed a society in conflict following the science or discounting and discrediting scientists and doctors, arguing over what constitutes an individual right versus our shared obligations to each other. We have observed the worst in people and witnessed incredible acts of compassion and heroism. And as I look back on last year, I cannot help but have a great sense of pride and satisfaction that despite the obstacles and challenges faced, the Mid-American Conference and its member institutions found a way to facilitate academic and athletics opportunities for more than 5,000 student athletes competing in the conference. We crowned champions in 24 sports, including the inaugural Women's Lacrosse Championship, one of 13 women's championships sponsored by the league. I remember going undefeated in two bowl games and having two top 25 teams in Ball State and Buffalo, winning a game in the NCAA men's basketball tournament for the third consecutive tourney, with Ohio knocking off defending NCAA champion Virginia, marking the second time the conference has put together such a streak. Kent State's women's golf team won its 22nd consecutive women's golf championship and advanced to the NCAA Finals. Miami's softball team finished with a 46-8 record, a school record for wins. And in men's soccer, the Mid-American Conference was the top-ranked soccer conference in the country. 
Yet somehow, the NCAA Men's Soccer Committee did not offer any at-large invites to MAC teams, even though the only two teams to defeat the national champion came from the Mid-American Conference. I still cannot understand the logic or lack of logic in those decisions. And we ended the year with Central Michigan pitcher Andrew Taylor being named National Freshman Pitcher of the Year and Co-National Freshman Player of the Year. With the Olympic and Paralympic Games almost upon us, I look forward to watching 11 current or former Mid-American Conference student athletes that will be competing. To get through the past year, our student athletes underwent a regular testing program. Last season, our football student athletes took more than 36,000 COVID tests. Through incredible discipline, attention to detail, and good fortune, we had a positivity rate of less than 0.5%. Simply amazing. A group that emerged as superstars for the membership are the members of the Mid-American Conference Medical Advisory Group. This group met on an almost weekly basis throughout the year, and through their efforts, we developed and revised COVID protocols and procedures, navigated differences in state and local health requirements, and ultimately, the efforts and expertise of the Medical Advisory Group piloted the membership through a unique and challenging time. Their efforts have been and continue to be greatly appreciated. It should be noted that we are not through with COVID-19, and I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of our coaches, student athletes, and in fact, all of us being vaccinated. The Delta variant is exceptionally virulent, and those not vaccinated are at greatest risk. Just think back to the recently concluded College Baseball World Series and the North Carolina State baseball team that was on the brink of winning a national championship when it was sent home. Unvaccinated participants are at risk and their team is at risk. Those who choose not to receive a vaccination will be in a testing protocol. And in addition, unvaccinated individuals will be subject to quarantine if they have a close contact with an infected individual. I encourage all of you who have not done so, please consult your doctor and get a vaccination. In addition to the challenges of COVID-19, a great spotlight was shined on social and civil rights inequities that exist. I greatly admired the efforts of so many of our student athletes as they shared their voices and provided leadership on their campuses and in their communities in addressing these issues with passion and in constructive ways. Also, the student athletes in a program established by the conference, but run by the student athletes, conducted a series called Courageous Conversations. Over the course of the past year, the student athletes had four conversations around issues of diversity and social justice, and four conversations on issues of mental health. There is no shortage of issues with regards to intercollegiate athletics. In April, after six years of study, discussion, and contemplation, the NCA membership approved a unified transfer policy. For years, NCA regulations have permitted student athletes in all but five sports the ability to transfer once and not require a year in, in residence to be immediately eligible for competition. In the sports of men's and women's basketball, football, baseball, and men's ice hockey, a one-time transfer exception was not permitted. After studying the issue, it became evident there was no educational basis for the differential treatment. What was ultimately approved was a one-time transfer exception for all student athletes. I expect the next couple of years will be choppy as both student athletes and coaches adapt to the revised rules. Clearly, there are too many student athletes who have entered the transfer portal many of whom have no realistic expectation of finding a place to transfer to. I expect both student athletes and coaching staffs will become savvier and more strategic in adjusting to the modernization of the transfer rules. In considering the unified transfer rules, there are additional rule changes which must take place in short order. First, 
There needs to be a change in the academic progress rate, or APR, so that programs are not penalized if a student athlete transfers. Programs will unfairly lose retention points and possibly be penalized for decisions made by the student athletes. The APR has been a tremendous tool in reinforcing the primacy of, of a student athlete's academic achievement. But just as transfer rules have been modernized, the APR must be reformed to account for changes in student athlete enrollment behaviors. Also, attention must be given to adjusting the initial signing cap regulations. When a football program falls behind in its squad size, often due to a change in coaching staff or student athletes moving on, it becomes almost impossible to catch up. There must be a way to permit a program the opportunity to rebuild its roster and do so in a way that does not encourage runoffs or oversigning or other negative behaviors that are behind the initial cap rule. The era of student athletes utilizing their name, image, and likeness to be compensated by third parties for things such as promotional activities and endorsements is upon us. Two years ago at our Council of Directors of Athletics meeting prior to Football Media Day, we spent several hours focused solely on this issue. We brought in legal and marketing executives and NCAA staff so that we could explore what this may mean. Since that time, we have had numerous discussions on this topic. It is unfortunate that we do not have a single national standard guiding us. It is a challenge to run national championships without national standards of conduct. Quite frankly, this is a failure by the entire association and reflects a lack of strategic direction and execution. The die was cast on this issue two years ago when the state of California passed NIL legislation. At that time, the NCAA had two choices. One, pursue a legal strategy challenging California and or implementing its own NIL legislation. The first was not pursued, the second was not accomplished. As a result, we are left with little direction at this time. Hopefully, Congress will act soon on this matter. For the student athletes, I view NIL as a tremendous multidisciplinary educational opportunity gives them an opportunity to maximize their potential. And to do so, they will need to become proficient in areas such as branding, marketing, communications, and in addition, gaining some knowledge in areas such as taxes or contracts, all useful skills as they pre prepare for life beyond college. There was significant attention around the recent US Supreme Court decision in the Alston case. And while I always thought the case could go either way, I will admit I was a bit surprised that it was a unanimous decision. What was missed in the commentary was this was a ruling dealing with a narrow set of additional benefits tethered to education. Institutions and conferences will now grapple with how to best manage these permissive educational benefits for student athletes. The bigger message I took away from the decision and from the concurring decision was the need for the membership of the NCAA to get its act together. For upwards of two decades, we have spoken of the need to modernize our rules. I look back at what were considered significant rule changes, allowing full scholarship athletes to hold jobs, cost of attendance, a unified transfer rule, in each case, you would have thought the entire enterprise of intercollegiate athletics was about to collapse based on feedback from many of the practitioners. Quite frankly, that's nonsense. If we as an association of member institutions cannot figure out how to become nimbler, to change and adapt without going through such extreme contortions, then the NCAA is at risk. And that risk is that someone else will make those decisions for the enterprise of intercollegiate athletics. Frankly, our current NCAA governance system is not efficient. Our system of developing, evaluating, and ultimately implementing regulations does not always provide for optimal outcomes. A couple of examples. Transfer rules had not undergone significant revision since the 1960s. 
And intercollegiate athletics is a vastly different enterprise than it was then. Yet it took us six years, six years, to make changes that if the NCAA membership did not change, the courts or state and federal government were going to do so for us. That's unacceptable. As another example, we have been asking our coaching groups and sports groups to re-examine the re recruiting rules, recruiting calendars, and recruiting practices. The Women's Basketball Coaches Association, under the leadership of Toledo head women's coach, Tricia Cullop, who served as the WBCA president last year, developed a comprehensive overhaul of the women's basketball recruiting rules. The proposed rule changes were innovative, thoughtful, and changed the way recruiting would take place in women's basketball to make it more sensible for both student athletes and the coaches. The knee-jerk reaction of many was to discount the proposals and to complain about competitive issues, which quite frankly were non-existent. Fortunately, we will have the opportunity to consider those proposals again in the coming year. We must figure out a way to modernize our rules and put a premium on creativity and innovation. There are only a few sacrosanct standards. Primarily, we do not pay student athletes and they are not employees. After that, we need to look long and hard at why we have a rule and what it accomplishes. it. Is it for the administrative ease or is it to protect or enhance the student athlete experience? My father, who spent 25 years as a coach and tenured professor, and then 25 years as a director of athletics, shared with me early in my career the following quote. There is nothing wrong in being professional and nothing holy in being amateur. Athletic immorality begins when having agreed, one, agreed to one, a college does the other. This was written by the Reverend Carl Henricks when he served as director of athletics at the university my father attended when he was a student athlete. This philosophy would serve us well as the foundation for our enterprise moving forward. The enforcement of NCAA rules has become fractured. I do not blame those trying to make the system work. I just question that serious infractions can be managed by the existing structure. Individuals facing significant sanctions have figured out how to stall and obfuscate. It takes too long for people who commit grave infractions to be penalized, which does little to discourage negative behaviors and hinders the integrity of the enforcement process. We spend entirely too much time and too many resources on insignificant matters. The membership of the NCA must become more strategic and show an ability to adapt or others will be making decisions for how we operate the enterprise of intercollegiate athletics. There are some rules and processes that perhaps can best be managed by conferences and member institutions. Some level of deregulation makes sense. Interestingly, as a conference, we've been talking about this for the past couple of years. However, we will need a set of uniform standards, rules, and processes to conduct equitable national competition and national championships. I fully support the effort to expand the college football playoff to 12 teams. While we have not taken a vote of our membership, I have had conversations with our presidents, directors of athletics, head football coaches, a group of our football student athletes, and we'll be talking shortly to our faculty athletics representatives. To date, the feedback has been positive. A two-team playoff was better than none. A four-team playoff was better than two. A 12-team playoff will be better than four. It will be more inclusive, fairer, and bring increased importance and relevancy to the regular season and conference championship games. I caution that there are some operational hurdles in the short term as we are under contract for the next five years. Hopefully later this fall, we can come to some conclusions on when we can move forward on this exciting expansion of the playoff. This marks the 75th anniversary or 75th season of Mid-American Conference football. What an incredible journey for this league. Amazing players and coaches across the decades have come through the Mid-American Conference. 
Let's take a quick look back. But intercepted. It's picked off. Khalil Mack is going to return it for a touchdown. 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 58 yards. Wreck him off. Jason Taylor with his eighth quarterback sack of the season. Well, everyone knows the Max being the cradle of coaches. Meyer named Mack coach of the year. Can we become the best football team that we've ever become? Period. I didn't get a chance to coach you against Roethlisberger, thank you. And now we'll avoid the rush again, rolling to the far side, to the back of the end zone, touchdown by Ben Throughout the season, we will share more about the remarkable people who have competed in this league. Finally, it's time to get back to action. Great coaches, talented and exciting student athletes, big non-conference games, big conference games, with the conclusion coming on Saturday, December 4th, when we kick off the Rocket Mortgage Mid-American Conference Football Championship at 12 noon, right here at Ford Field. It's what we've been waiting for. I wish our teams the very best. It's now time to fly the flag. Thank you, John. And